Welcome to John Gates Games. Today, I'll be doing a full three-player playthrough of Sailing Toward Osiris. This game is being funded through Kickstarter, and in it, the Pharaoh has died, and he is slowly working his way towards his eternal tomb on a funeral barge that is sailing down the Nile. The players around the table have taken on the role of governors who are tasked with erecting massive monuments towards the favor of the Pharaoh to better help his judgment in the afterlife. This game uses worker placement mechanics where the number of spots will increase and decrease as the game goes on, and the different types of workers you have to use will ebb and flow from round to round. I'll explain how the game works as we're actually playing it, so let's jump in. Here we have our three-player game fully set up. We'll be playing from the perspective of the purple player over here, and this means that we'll be the start player for the game. Each of us start with two of each of the materials, which are grain, brick, and stone. Although our opponents have these little shields up, so we won't be able to see uh, the materials they have or the laborers that they acquire, but I'll leave this one face up so we always know what we have to work with. The last thing I want to say before we jump into the first turn is that even though we have these wooden pieces and the art on the board, this is a prototype version of the game, so just keep that in mind. We have the Regent token, which is why we're going first, and the first thing that the Regent does in the beginning of every round is they pull out three workers from the bag, and they keep them hidden from their opponents. We see that we have a Master Brickmaker here, a regular Stonecutter, and a regular Farmer. We put these behind our screens, and then we pass the bag to our opponents, who also pull out three and hide them behind their screens. Once everyone's done that, the Regent pulls out workers from the bag so that there are only two left, and they put all of these into the labor market. So we see there are a couple regular brick makers, a regular stone cutter, and a master stone cutter. And you can tell if a uh, laborer is a master or not by having this little white skirt and white headdress. And lastly, there are two of these laborers left in the bag. And as a perk for being the regent, we get to peek in and see that it is a regular brick maker and a regular stone cutter, but none of our opponents know that. The game itself takes place over four rounds as the funeral barge works its way down the Nile. You'll see that it is split up into these four chunks, which is where the barge will be for each of these four rounds. In each round, each player will take one action and then go to the next and will keep going through until all of us have passed. So, we are the start players, we can begin by taking our first action. The goal of the game is to make the most points by putting out all three of these different types of monuments. We have these sphinxes, obelisks, and finally these massive pylons. And if you look out at the board, you can see the number of resources that are required to actually build all uh, three of these types of monuments, there are varying sets that work. And on all of these, especially the uh, ones that get you even more points, the obelisks are four points, the pylons are seven, but the sphinxes are just two, you can see we need lots of stone. And we do have this one regular stone cutter here. So for our first action, I think let's go grab some stone because we only have two at the moment. When you're placing a laborer onto the board, they must go into a spot that matches their region type. This is a stone cutter, they're gray, which means they must go into a mountain. And if you look around, every resource region has two different spots to it. And since this one was empty, we actually put the stone cutter in the middle and we generate resources for the whole region, which is four, so we pull these from the supply. And it's important to note that the number of resources in the supply is finite and it's a specific amount for this three player game. If you ever try to gain resources and they're not actually in the supply, you only take as much as you can and you lose the rest. So when you look at some of these other spots, we have these blue monuments down. They are from a potential fourth player. We are playing a three player game, so we put these in to tighten up the map. And you'll notice that they actually block one of the two halves for our region. So if you were to put a laborer down over here, you would only get the two resources instead of the four because the Sphinx is blocking it. Lastly, you'll note that this is a regular stone cutter, and we can see that there is a master one over here. The main difference is that regular uh, laborers must go in the region where the barge currently is or has already passed through, whereas the master laborers can be sent ahead on the Nile to gather resources before the barge arrives there. So we get our four resources, and I suppose it's also good to know that you're not allowed to put another uh, laborer down into a region that already has one. So by going into this mountain region, we are going to be the only ones to gather stone from this area unless some special card allows an opponent to do so. That completes our one action, so the play now moves over to the red player, and they have decided they are going to do something somewhat similar, but this time with a regular brick maker. And they decide to put it in this large clay pit, which is going to generate them four bricks for their area. And now comes the yellow player, and they've decided they're going to use this regular farmer, but they're going to do it in a slightly different way. They're going to grab this camel and start a caravan. When you look out on the board, there are these two caravan spots, but in a three-player game, we actually fill this one in with camels from non-player characters. There's only going to be one caravan to choose from in this three-player game. And when you're the first player to use the caravan in a round, you actually bring the camel along to show that you're the caravan leader. 
Now, when you go over here, you can either go in the top or the bottom part of the caravan, and you'll get to take all of the resources that are in that half. And then in the future, if somebody else goes into the top part to gain these resources, they actually have to pay a penalty to you of one of those resources. So this puts the uh, yellow player in a reasonable position. Of course, they could come in here and gather the top, in which case there would be no penalty because they would be in both parts of the caravan. So this means they're going to grab three bricks and two grain from the supply. It's once again our turn, and we have quite a few more resources than we did in our first turn, and let's take a look at some more options that we have. Everybody starts with this hand of cards. First of all, we all get a random city card from the top of the deck, and this one is a merchant, and for our action, we could just use this city card either to gather the two resources in the top left, so this would be a brick and a stone, or we could evaluate the bottom, which says that we could pay one resource to the supply to receive three of a different type of resource. So that's a very powerful uh, option if we uh, have a surplus of one thing and really need something else. But then we have these other five cards, and these are called boon cards, and every single player has an identical set of these, and you're allowed to play one boon each round of the game, and there's only four rounds, so the maximum you'll play is four out of the five boon cards. And the other thing is that once a player plays one of these boon cards, none of the other uh, players can play that specific boon in that given round. So I think this might be a decent time for us to just start and get one of these out. I'm thinking that we want to do the Boon of Bastet. Down at the bottom it says that we can take one laborer of our choice from the draw bag. So we're going to put this face up right here so that our opponents know that we've used Boon number two. They're not allowed to do that one as well in this round. And we can then look into the bag. We already know what's in there. And I think that we want to go ahead and take this brick maker right there. The reason for this is even though we have this master brick maker over here, we can now send that one way ahead on the Nile to potentially make a bunch of brick, and then use this one to make even more brick in our current area, or perhaps send them out to do some other type of errand. It's just good to have more laborers because it's more uh, action types you can do within a given round. The red player decides for their action they're going to use their regular farmer here, and they're going to head out into the fields, and we notice that there are actually three here and two here, so that means that they're going to get five grain. And now it comes to the yellow player, and they've decided they're going to spend two grain, and with it they're going to hire another laborer. We notice here that you can spend two of any resource, and you can mix and match as much as you want, although the grain is slightly more abundant. So they're going to spend the two, and they can hire any of these, and they've decided they would like a master stone cutter. It's also worth noting that the resources spent in order to hire new laborers stay in this area. They don't actually go back to the main supply until the end of the round. It's once again our turn, and I think that we need a bunch of brick to try and complement the amount of stone we have. If we want to get some of these bigger monuments out, we certainly have enough resources to get one of these sphinxes down, but they're worth a lot less points. And I think for the moment, maybe let's build up and try and potentially get maybe an obelisk out in this round, or perhaps a pylon. Let's see what the options are going to be available to us as we uh, progress through it. For now, it just seems like a good idea to put our brick maker down here because it's open, and this is going to get us four bricks from the supply. It's now the red player's turn, and they've decided they want to go to the market. There are four stalls that are open, and in each you can trade either the top for the bottom or the bottom for the top once. And the red player decides they are going to spend four of these grain, and that is going to get them two stone from the supply. And this grain now actually stays in the market, and it also blocks off that one specific stall until the end of the round. It's now the yellow player's turn, and they've decided to use the first city card of the game. Again, you could use the top to get a couple resources, but they've decided they want to do the bottom, which says barge captain. They can play a laborer ahead of the pharaoh's barge, so that means they could take this regular stone cutter, and it can effectively act as a master stone cutter for them on this round, because they can jump ahead of the barge, plunk down over here, and get themselves four more stone from the supply. And as you can see, the supply is starting to dry up a little bit, as we are all kind of uh, generating and hoarding these resources, and not quite spending them just yet. Speaking of hoarding resources, we have quite a few at the moment, and I think we should do a little bit more of this. Let's go ahead and use this regular farmer right now because there's a good opportunity available to us. Because when you look at the area that the barge is in, there's only one more grain gathering spot. So let's just go ahead and do that. You can save uh, resources from round to round, so there's really no reason not to have quite a few of them. And we're going to be able to grab all five of these. It's now the red player's turn, and they've decided they are done with hoarding resources. They want to start getting monuments built. And this is a two-step process. You have to first plan your monument. So you take the token, and then you put it on the uh, selected spot that you want that's going to match the resources that you want to spend. And they're going to go with this middle one. So this is going to cost them 
two stone. It's also going to cost them two brick and two grain from their area. These go directly back into the supply. And now this means that none of uh, the uh, their opponents can actually plan the same type of Sphinx for as long as the Sphinx is here, and they can bring it out with another action on a future turn. It appears the yellow player isn't ready to plan just yet. They're now going to use this Master Stonecutter, and they're going to send it way ahead on the Nile, all the way over here, which allows them to gather four more stone. There are only two left in supply at this point. It's our turn once again, and we do still have this Master Brickmaker, and I think that what we're probably going to try and do is not actually build any monuments in this first round, but set ourselves up so that we can build a couple in the next round. I'm thinking maybe trying to drop a couple of these obelisks because there's actually a little bit of a race here. The first player to get all of their sphinxes built is going to get a one bonus point. The first player to get all of their obelisks down get two, and the same, the first player to get both of their pylons down get a bonus points of two. So I think maybe preparing ourselves to drop a couple big obelisks in the next round is probably going to be a little bit better than trying to build them right now, and the reason for that is because you're not allowed to actually place the monument down into a region that already has a worker in it. And as you can see, each of these monuments have different types of regions that they can be built into. And in the starting region over here, we've already filled up all of the spots. Now you can actually build a monument ahead of the barge, but you get plus one bonus point if you build in the same section as the barge because it kind of watches uh, the wonder kind of get uh, created right around them. So I think that is part of the reason why we should wait and then try to build a couple monuments in this zone on the next round once the barge has actually moved forward. So with all that being said, let's send our master bricklayer ahead. We'll go right over here, and we'll grab four bricks from the supply, so there's only one left at the moment. Red now decides they want to build this Sphinx, and if you look over here, you can see that it can only go on the two resource sections for grain, brick, and stone. But instead of just doing a regular build action, they're actually making their action be a boon. This one is the Boon of Isis. It says that it can build a monument on half of a terrain space only occupied by a laborer. So they look out over here, they see that this uh, food area is occupied by this labor. They're going to push the labor kind of up, and they're going to get to drop this Sphinx down here. So this is one of the ways that you can get around having all these spots be taken up. And if you look down here, they'll get two points for the Sphinx, and one point because they went in the same region as the barge. So that's going to be three points for red. They're the first ones on the board. And it's also worth noting that there are some endgame victory points that we're all trying to think about. The first is that if we have three monuments that are adjacent to each other uh, on the map, then that'll be a bonus of two points. And if we have four monuments that are adjacent to the same river section, then we'll get three bonus points. So it seems likely that the red player decided they want to go here because this uh, region is adjacent to one, two, three, four other spots, which is a lot compared to some of the other ones like this or this one that are just adjacent to two. Yellow is now up and they've decided they want to plan this massive pylon monument. They're going to put it down into this section, which means it's going to cost two grain, four brick, and eight stone, all of which they have after gathering a whole bunch of stuff. So this will go right here, and they're definitely hoping to place it this round. It's our turn once again, and we don't have any more laborers, but there are still some options. And since we're planning on trying to drop down two uh, obelisks on the next round of the game, we can kind of try and plan ahead, and we see that we have six stone. And so if we're trying to do the three stone uh, spending over here so we can get two of these down, that means we're going to need 12 bricks available to us, and we currently only have 10. So I think that we should go to the market. We should spend two of our grain right here, because this is going to get us two more brick, which brings us up to 12, which means we are really set up to get both of those omelisks built. It's now the red player's turn, and they're going to use this master farmer. They're going to send the master far ahead of the barge to this zone here, which will allow them to gather five grain from the supply. And there's all, now only one grain. And it's kind of interesting to note that the uh, bricks and the stone have been flowing back in steadily because the monuments have been being built. But the uh, grain has a little bit, but also it gets jammed up in these market areas. You can, of course, spend a stone here to get two grain. But for the most part, it seems like people oftentimes spend grain to get these harder to acquire resources. So grain gets harder and harder to gather as the round gets closer to the end. But then, of course, all these dump back over when we start the next round over. It's Yellow's action now, and they want to use this one farmer. But there's only one grain in the supply, so they've decided they're going to use this farmer in a different way. You may have noticed these locations along the Nile that look a little different than the resource gathering spots we've been using. These are cities, and you can send any type of worker to any city on the Nile, even those ahead of the barge, in order to activate them. And when you actually do this, you draw two cards from the top of the city deck, and then the player chooses one of these, and then they're forced to give the other card to one of their opponents. Yellow's decided they want to keep this card here, but they decide to show the other one to the both of us. We, it says that it's an ox team master. It lets you take 
uh, three resource tokens from the labor pool, which is the resource that you use to hire new laborers, or it gives a food and a stone. And they have to give it to one of us, and they say, well, what are you going to give me for it? Because this is actually another aspect to this entire game, and that is bartering. At any point in the game, you are allowed to try and trade one thing for another, and you could trade things like the resources you have available to you, you could trade your laborers in your area, you could trade cards from your hand, and you can even trade uh, promises for future actions, although that's not strictly enforceable in the future. So at this point, we both think about it. We, of course, don't want um, our opponent to have access to it. Uh, we decide we are willing to give up one food in order to gather uh, one grain, sorry, to get this card uh, so that the red player doesn't get it. The red player says that they are willing to give up two food in order to take this card. I guess they like the look of the stone. And, well, we actually want to have four grains that are ready to do those two uh, obelisk actions. It's likely we'd get more grain, but it seems like trying to match that or even exceed it doesn't make that much sense for us. So uh, we are going to not uh, add more to that bid, and the red player is going to take this. Again, They we didn't need to actually offer anything. We could have just left it to the yellow player to give it to one of us, but the red player thought it was worthwhile, so they're going to give two food over to the yellow player and take the card. And now it comes back to us, and it might look like we should just plan a wonder, but you're not allowed to actually have a wonder out on one of these planning spots once the round ends. If there any wonders are out here, they're actually removed from the game. And there is one boon in here which lets you go from one round to the next, the boon of Osiris, but you can only play one boon uh, in each given round, and we've already played one. So because of that, we are just going to hoard our resources and hope to get them down quickly in the next round, and we have decided we are going to withdraw. So this is our withdraw token. We're going to put it out onto the board. And we get to put it down on this Regent track because we are the first to withdraw in this first round of the game. So we're going to get all of the bonuses that are listed on the specific spot that we go to. And there is a variety of options. I mean, just one victory point and a brick sounds pretty good. Getting a stone and a random card from the top of the deck could be a big deal as well because those cards can have some really good powers that in certain situations can mean a lot more points that go down onto the board. And then, of course, lots of resources are other options, but we're limited by the stuff in the market. There is a lot of stone out there right now. But I think let's uh, hedge our bets, gather one stone, and we'll get one random card from the top of the deck. So let's see. This is the Master Merchant. We could get a stone and a grain, or we could take the resource tokens from one of the market spaces. That's very interesting. Of course, we've withdrawn for the round, so we can't do this until future rounds, but that would have potentially let us just gather the four uh, grain that are on this spot right here, or maybe even other stuff if people trade back to gather grain. So with that, we have now withdrawn, and when our opponents withdraw, they'll just put their tokens over to the side. Only the first person to withdraw gets the bonus. It's now the red player's turn. They also choose to withdraw. They would have loved to have done this first because this is also going to dictate who the start player is for the next round. So we're going to be start player again. But going second is not that big of a deal. And the options uh, open up as the barge goes farther and farther down the river. So there's less uh, competition for those one specific spots. So they are going to withdraw from the round. And it goes over to the yellow player who has this massive pylon that they really need to get built before they can withdraw. So they are not. Instead, they're going to build this out onto the map. And if you look over here, you can see these get built on city spaces or on the three grain field spots out on the board. There is one city that is adjacent to the section that the funeral barge is currently on, so yellow is definitely going to place right there, so they get a bonus one point. And the base points for pylons is seven, so that means yellow is going to come right out the gate with eight points. We have already withdrawn, and so has the red player, so it comes right back to yellow, and at this point, they are done, so they're going to withdraw as well. And we have now completed one round, and it's time to do a little bit of cleanup. The first thing we do is advance the funeral barge into the next segment, so now the regular laborers can go into any of these sections as well as these that the barge has already passed through. And after that, we're going to return all of the camels. It looks like only the yellow player uh, went to the spot here, nobody went into the secondary one, so this goes back to their area. All of the resources in the market stalls as well as the labor market go back into the supply. And next, we can give these withdraw discs back to the players that put them down, uh, with a special exception for the person who actually did the regent one. So we do actually get it back, but we take one of these regent blocking discs and put it down here. And what this means is that this option is now blocked for the rest of the game. So in the second round, there will only be four options. In the third round, there will be three. And in the final round of the game, there will only be two bonus options left for the player who actually withdraws first. This also means that we will be the regent for the second round, so this token will just stay with us. 
We now pull all the laborers off the board and we put them back into the bag. And this would actually include any laborers that were in our areas. We're not allowed to save them from one round to the next. So obviously we were all very much incentivized to spend all of them. Although there might come a time where we actually want to withdraw to take a bonus instead of actually spending a laborer, but we'll see if that happens. We can now take the boon cards that were played. It looks like the yellow player did not play one, but we did and so did the red player. And these were removed from the game. And lastly, we would remove any monuments from any of these planning tracks that actually did not get built, but nobody was foolish enough to not actually complete them. So there's none to remove, and that is it for cleanup. We can now move into the next round. The first thing that happens is once again, we all pull three laborers from the bag. It looks like we have two farmers and a stonecutter, all regular ones, no masters, unfortunately. And then we pull all but two from the bag, put them down into the market. We have a nice variety going on there, and we can look at the remainders and see that there is a regular brick maker and a regular farmer. So we uh, have no masters and there are no masters in the market, which means all three of the masters are split between our two opponents, unfortunately. For our first turn, let's go ahead and start the plan that we were kind of working towards in the first round of the game. Let's get these obelisks built. So we're gonna take this one right here. We're gonna plan it into this location so that we can spend all three of these stone and then we've set it up so that we actually have the 12 bricks we need to build two of these. So we'll start with those two and of course the two grain. It appears the bed player was also set up. They decide for their first action, they're going to plan a two stone, two brick and two grain sphinx. For yellow's first action, they're gonna use a regular brick maker. And they actually have four different clay fields they can go into, but they're gonna go into this one because they have a hunch that the red player wants to build that Sphinx in this area, so they're gonna make it a lot harder, essentially forcing them to spend a special card in order to play here this round. Of course, the red player can play it later on, but they won't get the bonus points for having the barge here. So either way, the yellow player goes here and they're gonna get four bricks from the supply. It's back to us and let's actually get this obelisk down. We definitely want to put it into this river segment because we'll get the bonus point for having the barge. We're really hoping to get two of these down and uh, get two of those bonus points in this round. So looking at the options, I feel like the thing that's most flexible is if we go right here, this kind of uh, it definitely hurts the um, functionality and the uh, production ability of this mountain range, which means it's less likely for somebody to put a labor over here before we get our second uh, uh, obelisk down. And if somebody does do that, well, then we can just go over here with our second obelisk and hope to fill this in later on in the game. So we'll put this here. That's four points plus one for the barge is five, and we jump to five points. For Red's action, they decide they are going to put the Sphinx down. They look a little miffed that they did indeed want to go over there, but they've decided they don't mind going over here too much. So that is just going to be worth two points plus one for being in the barge area, or three points. They were at three, now they're at six. Yellow has decided to use their regular stone cutter, and they're going to send them behind the barge into this mountain region, which is going to get them four stone. It seems like the yellow player is trying to rebuild a stockpile of resources after spending most of them last turn getting this large monument down. It's back to us, and there's no time like the present. We have the resources we need. Let's get this next obelisk into the planning phase so that we can hopefully get that down in the spot we want before any of our opponents kind of mess with our plans by putting a laborer down into one of those good spots for us. The red player decides they're going to play this baker card. They're going to do the bottom, and it says that they can pay one grain to the supply in order to choose a laborer from the labor pool and then use it immediately. They've decided to grab this one regular brick maker, put them over there, which is going to generate for them four bricks. Yellow now shows that they have the master stone cutter and they're going to use them. And they're going to go ahead of the barge all the way up to this mountain region here, which is going to get them four stone. It's our turn again, and we are happy that we were able to set this up to rush getting both of these obelisks down because nobody got in our way. So we can go ahead and go right there. So we're adjacent to uh, this uh, the barge right here. We also now have two different options to get uh, three monuments in a row for that two point bonus. So that obelisk is four plus one. It means that we now jump into the lead with 10 points. It's the red player's turn and they're gonna use a master farmer. And they don't actually have to send it ahead of the barge. So they decided to go back over here and they're gonna grab five grain from the bank. It's the yellow player's turn and they've decided they wanna get their first pylon down and they're actually gonna put it over here. So that's gonna cost them five stone, two brick, and two food, which they can now put back in the supply. It's our turn again, and right now we only have one grain. So we've used all of our resources. We need to try and build these back up. And unfortunately, by getting these obelisks down early in the round, we have given up some of the uh, good opportunities to grab a bunch of resources. But I think we still have an okay one. We're gonna use this regular farmer here. They have to go where the barge is or behind, and they're just gonna go over here. Sure, three is not as good as five, but I think getting three grain for that worker is still not too bad. 
For Red's turn, they've decided to play the Boon of Horus. It says they can move one laborer from the map to the worker pool and then take another turn. They've decided to kick out this regular stone cutter so that they can put their own stone cutter down here, and that is going to get them four stone. For Yellow's turn, they've decided to build this obelisk into this section of the uh, grain field. That is going to be four points plus one for being in the same section as the barge. They were at eight, so now they're at 13. The red player wants to use this master brick maker, and they're going to send them ahead of the barge to this clay pit over here, which is going to generate them four bricks from the supply. For Yellow's turn, they've decided to call upon the Boon of Bastet. This one lets them take a laborer from the draw bag. So they get to look at their options and choose the one they want. It's our turn again. We do have these two city cards and uh, all of these Boon cards available, although we cannot actually do the three because the red player did that already. But I think at the moment, when we look at the options we have, there's just nowhere to actually put this stone cutter. All of the uh, mountain regions that are available to a regular one are occupied. So instead, let's go ahead and start a caravan. We can either take two stone and a grain, or three brick and two grain. I think that at the moment, since we don't have a specific game plan, let's take the thing that gives us more stuff. So that's going to be two grain and a three brick from the supply. Not too bad for that one stone cutter there. It's the red player's turn, and they've decided to put four grain into the market so that they can grab two stone from the supply. Yellow decides to use this regular brick maker. And there's still a really good spot for them to go into these clay pits here, which is going to generate them four brick, which happens to be exactly the amount of brick that's currently in the supply. At the moment, as far as laborers are concerned, we just have this regular farmer left. And as far as options to place them down, we could either go into one of the cities to draw two cards, but then we have to give a card to one of our opponents. However, they might give us resources in return. Or, you know, I think let's just go over here. We can go into this caravan even though we started it. There is no penalty associated with going into a caravan we started. So this one farmer can just make us two stone and one food. This seems like an okay set of resources to start planning for our next big build, which will likely be in the next round. It's now the red player's turn, and they've decided to withdraw because they're the first ones to do so, and they get a nice little bonus here. They're going to choose this one and take three stone from the supply. And it then goes to the yellow player, who has decided they are going to withdraw as well. They could have withdrawn a couple turns ago. Instead of doing the boon of Bastet and getting a laborer, which they then used in that clay pit, they could have withdrawn and taken a bonus, but they decided not to, and they are going to just withdraw, and they'll be going second in the third round of the game. This means it goes back to us, and in fact, we can keep taking as many turns as we want to because both of our opponents have withdrawn. And I figure we may as well just use this Master Merchant right now. It lets us take the resources from one market space. Well, this space right here has four grain on it. That seems like a pretty good thing to grab. And when it comes back around to us, um, I think let's just go ahead and use that same spot again in order to grab two stone from the supply. We haven't used a boon yet this round, and these are the only ones that are available to us because, again, we can't do the number three because that was already taken, and we've used the two already, so we don't have to worry about that. But the thing is that these boons don't do anything for us. This one down here says the boon of Anubis. You can move one of your monuments on the map to a new legal position, which is very powerful, but we don't really care about moving our monuments just yet. The next one is Boon of Isis, which lets you, uh, we've seen this one already, you can build a monument on a section by scooting a laborer over if they're already there. And the last one is the Boon of Osiris, which lets us um, pass on to the next round with having a uh, monument out here. None of these three are particularly interesting to us. And we do have this merchant that we can use, which lets us discard one resource to get three of another. And I just don't think we desperately need to use this just yet in this moment. We're not sure what our exact plan is. Of course, we'd like to get this last obelisk out, especially considering Yellow has now built one. But with so many resources, we, I don't think, are too worried about losing on that little race. The last thing realistically that we could do out on the board is we could trade with a market, but there are only two stone left and no brick, so that doesn't even really make sense for us. And of course, we could also try to barter some of the resources we have with our opponents. Just because they've withdrawn does not mean that they cannot trade back and forth with us, but again, we're not in this position where we desperately need anything in particular, so let's go ahead and withdraw, and that will end the round. The barge once again moves farther down the river. We get our camel back, and then all of these resources go back into the supply. The red player now takes this regent token. We're all going to get our discs back, and this spot is now blocked for the rest of the game. Next up, we are going to return all of the laborers into the bag. And lastly, we can remove these two boon cards from the game. With that, we are ready for round three. The red player is going to go first, so they can go ahead and dig into the bag of laborers, pull three out for themselves, and then pass it along to all of us. 
I'm very curious to see what we are going to grab out of the bag. We are unfortunately going third in this round, and it looks like we have, oh, two masters. We have a master stonecutter and a master brick maker and then another brick maker. So I guess it's a good thing that we have all of this grain right now because we're not going to be great at making it this round. And lastly, the red player brings out all but two from the bag, and then of course they get to peek in the bag and see what the two remaining are. For Red's first action of the round, they are going to plan one of their pylons. They're going to put it up here, which means it's going to cost them 6 stone, 8 brick, and 2 grain. All of which are going to go back into the supply, and suddenly brick is available for all of us again. For Yellow's first action, they're going to use a regular farmer. And they're going to put it in this region that is near the barge. This means they're going to get 5 grain from the supply. It's back to us, and we definitely want to be able to build something into this spot right here. And we are a little concerned that somebody is going to uh, put a laborer in here. We do, of course, have the boon, which will let us put a, a monument down if we need to, to kind of scoot them over. The issue is that we don't quite have enough resources to get one of our obelisks built at this point. With only three brick right here, we would actually need one more stone. It just doesn't quite work out. So I think in order to try and race ahead and maybe get there before we actually have to burn that boon card, which potentially um, could be really important in the last round, although you can only use one boon per round, so I guess having a variety is not uh, the best thing in the world, but you can only choose one. Let's go ahead and throw one of these sphinxes down and into the planning area. We only have three bricks at the moment, which means we can only do this one or this one, and I figure we have an abundance of grain. Let's go ahead and go here and conserve our bricks a bit. So that's going to be two stone, two bricks, and two grain into the supply. For Red's turn, they've decided to build their pylon, and they're going to put it into this city because, again, they can put it into cities or the three grain fields. So this matches the same region as the barge. Also, it's adjacent to this sphinx right here, so they're um, one away from being able to get all three that they need to get the bonus two points at the end of the game. So the pylon is seven plus one for the barge means they're going to gain eight points, and that jumps them all the way up to 14, and they're now currently in the lead. On Yellow's turn, they decide to use a regular stone cutter. And they're going to send him way back here to the only mountain range that the regular one can go to that will currently give them four stone. So that seems like a pretty good deal for them. It's our turn again. We rush to get this Sphinx done so we could put it into this spot. So let's go ahead and do that. That's going to be two points plus one for the barge. And it also means at the end of the game, we have the two points locked in for having three monuments next to each other. So we were at 10 points. We add three. And we're now tied with yellow at 14. For Red's turn, they are calling upon the Boon of Anubis. This lets them move one of their monuments on the map to a new legal location, and then immediately take another turn. And they've decided that this Sphinx over here is not really doing much for them, so they're going to move it over to this spot, which is the only spot in a three-player game that is actually adjacent to two different river segments. Now, this is good for them because they can now compete a little bit better for trying to get the four monuments on one side adjacent to one piece of the river, for that extra three points at the end of the game, they now have two monuments on this side and one monument on that side, although this brings me to a good point with these two endgame scoring conditions. Within each condition, you can only use each monument once. So that means if I was to put a fourth monument over here, for instance, I would not get two chunks of three. I would consume three and there would be a chunk of just one. So that means that this monument can only really uh, give its influence to one side of the river or the other. It just means that the red player is more flexible for which whatever one is going to potentially give them endgame points. It's now Yellow's turn, and they've decided they're going to plan their last pylon. They uh, kind of delayed a little bit putting down one of these obelisks, but now that the red player has gotten one out, they feel the race they want to get this out um, so that they get both of them down, and they get the two-point bonus for being the first to get all of uh, these down. So they are going to plan over here which means they put 8 stone, 4 brick, and 2 grain back into the supply. It's now back to us, and we have a bunch of grain, but not that much stone or brick, so I figure let's try and fix that situation. Let's start off by uh, sending one of these brick. Actually, I take it back. Let's go ahead and send this person out, because there's only one good mountain range left on the map, and uh, we can try and grab 4 stone. These mountains are actually in front of the barge, so we're able to do that with the master stone cutter. And as you can see, there are still a couple spots where you can put down the uh, brick makers to get a bunch of bricks. So we will go ahead and grab all of the stone. It's of course likely that this spot would still be open for us, but it's a possibility that somebody could build a monument there before we actually sent our stone cutter. So, so we ensured it by getting there first. It's now the red player's turn, and I just realized that I actually forgot that the red player was supposed to take another turn after they played the Boon of Anubis on their last turn. So instead, I'm just going to do two turns in a row for the red player to try and fix that mistake. And the first one is going to be playing down this Master Farmer. They can place it either before or behind the barge. They don't see a particularly strong uh, reason to go either way, so they'll place down here and go ahead and grab five grain from the supply. 
And now for their actual turn, they're going to use this regular brick maker. They'll go into this spot right here and grab four brick from the supply. For yellow's action, they're going to go ahead and place this pylon down onto the map. They're going to put it into this city up here, which is in the same section as the barge. So that means they get seven points plus one for the barge. And then also they're the first person to get both of their pylons down. So that's a bonus of two points. So all told, that was a 10 point placement. They were at 13 points. So now they're at 23. It's back to our turn, and we don't have many bricks, but we do have two uh, brick makers, which is pretty good. Also, when we look out at the board, we see that we have two monuments in this one river segment, and there are currently one, two, three spots left over where we can put other monuments. Actually, technically four spots because of this city right here. So at this point, I think it might make sense for us to try and get another monument down into one of these three spots so that we can work towards having four monuments in a river section to get three bonus points. I think that might be slightly better than trying to cram it into this upper segment where the barge is currently. Obviously, we're going to try and probably get at least one more monument down where the barge is before the game ends in the next round. But for now, I think we definitely need brick. So let's go ahead and use this regular brick maker. And we can place them behind the barge over here, which will get us four bricks. The red player thinks that was a pretty good turn, so they're going to do essentially the same thing. This is the last double clay pit available for this round, so they'll go over here and grab four bricks from the supply. The yellow player decides they want to start a caravan, and they're going to do it for the top portion, which is going to get themselves two stone and then one grain. It's back to us, and I think that we should plan our final obelisk. We may as well just go here, spend four of our stone, we'll also spend four brick, and then two grain. Red has decided they want to plan their third sphinx, and they're going to go over here, so they spend only one stone, but they will also have to spend four brick and then two grain to do so. For yellow's turn, they're going to spend two grain into the labor market, and they're going to hire one of these regular stone cutters. For our turn, let's go ahead and put this obelisk down into this spot here, because again, they can go on the two regions or a three grain region. This is going to get us four points, and it now means that we have three uh, monuments in this one river segment. We just need to squeeze one more in to get a bonus of three points at the end of the game. So those four points bring us from 13 all the way up to 17 points. The red player is now going to place their monument as well. This is going to go into the same segment as the barge into this spot right here because it's just two of the resources there. That is going to get them two plus one for the barge is three points. So they were at 14. And now the tie with us at 17. Yellow now decides to invoke the Boon of Horus. This one lets them move a laborer from the map uh, to the labor pool, and then they get to take another turn. They've decided to bump this stone cutter out so that they can put their own in, and now they can grab four stone for themselves. This is a good move to grab resources, but it could also be used to place a monument down into a spot that's being blocked by one of the workers. It's back to us, and we still have this master brick maker. But unfortunately, all of the double clay pits are now full. We could go over here to get two clay, but instead, let's go ahead and start a caravan. This is going to get us three clay, and it's also going to get us two grain. However, because we did not start off this caravan chain, the yellow player did, we have to give them one of these five resources, and we'll just give them a food. Red decides they're going to spend two grain into the labor market in order to hire one of these farmers. Uh, they Again, you can actually spend other resources beside grain, but grain seems to be the most abundant in general, so that's frequently the one that's spent over there. We now come over to the yellow player, and for the first time in the game, they're going to withdraw first, and they're going to put their token right over here. So they get four brick, and it means they'll be the starting player for the final round of the game. It's back to us, and we currently don't have any laborers, but there are a couple on the market, and there's no reason to withdraw early now that the yellow player has done so. There's no bonuses to be had there, so let's go ahead and spend these two grain. And let's go ahead and buy ourselves a stone cutter, although this is interesting, only two people have been hired, and there's actually six resources here, which means I must have messed up at one point. Maybe I forgot to scoop these back into the supply. Sorry about that. Red decides to use this regular farmer, and they're going to grab five grain from the supply. Yellow has withdrawn, so it jumps over to us. And let's go ahead and use this regular stone cutter that we just hired last turn. And we'll send them up into the mountains over here. So we essentially turned two grain into two stone, which is a very good conversion rate. Red now decides to spend four of their grain in order to turn that into two stone for their area. Now that it's back to our turn, I think let's try something a little sneaky. Let's plan a sphinx, and we'll put it over here. So that's going to cost us one of our stone, all of our bricks, and then, of course, two of our grain, and we're not actually going to build it on this round. On the next turn, 
we're going to use the Boon of Osiris, which is going to allow us to kind of hold this between rounds. We haven't used any other boons. We have these four available to us at the moment, but our opponents have used one and three, so they're not even available to us this turn. So we figure we may as well use this since we can. And the reason for that is because that means on our first action, we can place this Sphinx down into this spot right here, effectively cutting off the ability for the red player to actually get three uh, monuments that are adjacent to each other. And that will cost them two points. And that could be uh, the game right there. We'll see how it ends up panning out. But for now, that is our turn. The red player is none the wiser and they decide that they are ready to withdraw. So it comes back to us and let's just do the plan we just talked about. So that was the boon of Osiris and it says that you may withdraw without building one planned monument. So that means by putting this down, we now withdraw as well. And this monument over here is safe from getting ripped off the board when we do the reset. As always, we start with the barge that's going to move down the Nile into the last segment. So this is going to be the final round. At this point, all segments of the river have been essentially unlocked for our regular laborers. And what that actually means is that whenever you use an advanced laborer in the last round of the game, instead of getting the bonus of going ahead, now you just get plus one resource when you actually go to grab them because any laborer can go anywhere on the map. Now we grab the camel back. All of these resources get flushed back into the supply. It looks like the yellow player will be the regent for the last round of the game. We can put the blocking token right over here, and then all of us are going to get our tokens back. And it looks like the first player to withdraw in the final round of the game will have a choice. They either get a point, or they will take five resources, which helps you on a tiebreaker. I think it's pretty obvious that whoever's going to withdraw first is going to take that point. All of the laborers can now be returned to the bag. And we are going to discard all of the boons, and normally we would discard any unbuilt monuments here, but the boon of Osiris is going to protect our Sphinx. And with that, we can move into the fourth and final round of the game. Yellow is going to begin by pulling three uh, workers out of the bag for themselves, and then we get to see what three laborers we will start the last round off with. It looks like, ooh, two masters, and we get one of each. That's awesome as far as the colors. That's probably going to be good for our different options when we try to get these last monuments out. And then, of course, we need to put the last four down onto the map, leaving two in the bag. For Yellow's first action, they're going to come right out the gate and play the Boon of Anubis, which allows them to move one of their monuments to a new legal position and then take another turn. The obelisk down here isn't doing much for them, so they've decided to move it up here so that it's adjacent to their pylon, so they now have uh, two good opportunities to at least make a group of three adjacent ones for those two endgame bonus points. We already know what we want to do for our first action. We set it up in the last round. We're going to put the Sphinx down right into this spot. This is going to be built in the same section as the Funeral Barge, so that means we get to two plus one or three points. We were at 17, so we're now at 20. Red decides to play their Master Stone Cutter. And they're going to put it way back at the beginning of the board. And again, since this is the final round, you get plus one resource with the Masters. So this means they're going to grab five stone from the supply. For Yellow's turn, they're going to plan the building of this obelisk. They're going to put it over here, which is going to cost them three stone, six bricks, and two grain. It's now our turn, and we're the only ones who have not built any of these pylons yet. And I think we really want to try and get at least one of these built, maybe one of these and one of these sphinxes. Uh, getting both these sphinxes isn't going to do much for us because I think it's very likely that the red player will get their last one out to get that one bonus point before we'd be able to do that. So for the moment, considering it's getting very hard already to actually uh, get stone from the board because of all the monuments going down, let's go ahead and send out our regular stone cutter. And we could put them right over here. This is going to get us two stone from the supply, and this is especially good because we know that the yellow player really wanted to build this obelisk there so that it was adjacent and then also in the same zone as the funeral barge. So the yellow player can still put their obelisk over here, but that's effectively denying them one point. On red's turn, they decided to get their second pylon built. They're going to put it right over here, which is going to cost them eight stone, four brick, and two grain. It's Yellow's turn, and they are indeed bummed that we blocked them, but they're still going to build this obelisk over here, so they have three uh, that are adjacent to each other. That is going to get them four points, so they were at 23, and now they're up to 27. If we're going to get anything built, we're going to need bricks, and we're going to need uh, to get grain. I think let's go ahead and send this farmer out, and we can place back here at the beginning of the Nile. This is going to get us five plus one because we have our advanced farmer, so that is six grain for us right now. It's now the red player's turn, and they've decided to build their pylon not over here where the barge is, but instead back here because this is a three grain area, so that is one of the options for putting these pylons down, and it also means they now have three that are adjacent to each other. So with that, they are going to get seven points, which bumps them up to 24. 
For Yellow's turn, they're going to use this regular brick maker, and they're going to harvest four bricks from these clay pits. It comes back to us, and I think our turn is still simple. We just need to keep acquiring resources so that we can start caching them out and hoping to get two more monuments down. So let's go ahead and put this master brick maker out. We want the most bricks possible, so we'll go into one of these two double fields. We'll go there. That's four plus one for the master. means that we're going to get five bricks. The red player can see that the double clay pits are drying up quickly, so they're going to send out this regular brick maker. In fact, this is the last double clay pit on the board right now, so they're going to grab four bricks for that. Yellow's now going to utilize this regular farmer, and they'll go into the fields over here, which will get them five grain. It's our turn again, and in order to get one of these pylons out, we're either going to need eight stone or eight bricks. Well, right now we have five stone and only five bricks, so I think what we should do is use this merchant. We've had her all game long, and this lets us discard one good, and I think we'll get rid of one of these grains back to the supply. In order to grab three of a different resource, let's go ahead and get three stone, so that will bring us up to eight. And this means on the next turn, we will have enough to get our first pylon built, I guess our first and only pylon in this game, most likely. The red player now invokes the boon of Bastet. They were able to actually use four out of their five boons. They did one every single turn. This one lets them take one laborer of their choice from the draw bag. Yellows decided they want to start a caravan. And they're going to go to the bottom part of it, so that will get them two grain and three brick from the supply. It's finally time for us to plan a pylon. We are going to put it down in this side right here because we have exactly eight stone. We can get rid of these two grain and then, of course, the four brick. And we're hoping that, well, somehow we can potentially turn this into enough stuff to get one of these sphinxes down as well. But at this point, I'm starting to not be too terribly confident. On Red's turn, they want to use this regular farmer. And they're going to go to the last double field that's currently open. So that's going to get them five grain. On Yellow's turn, they decide to plan their last obelisk. They're going to put it over here, so that's going to cost them three stone, six brick, and two grain. I think it's time for us to get this pylon down onto the board, and as much as I'd love to go where the barge is for the extra point, I think we should put it down into this city, because this is going to be our fourth monument on this river section, and that is worth three points to us at the end of the game. So three is definitely better than one. So by putting this here, we are going to get seven points for ourselves right now. We're currently at 20, so that brings us up to 27. Red now wants to use this regular stone cutter, and they're going to send it to the only mountain spot that's still available on the board. That's just going to get them two stone. It now comes to Yellow's turn, and they look a little bummed. They were perhaps hoping to build on both of those spots to have four on this river section, but since they've already used a boon, and they don't appear to have a city card that lets them displace these, they have changed their plan, and instead they're going to build this obelisk right over here. That is a uh, two of a clay spot, so that's fine, and they'll get four points plus one for the barge is five. They were at 27, so now they're at 32. It's back to our turn, and it's time to figure out if there's any way we can get some more points out of this game. Well, right from the get-go, we cannot use this boon because the yellow player used this one already. So that leaves us these two left over. This one would let us um, build a monument on a spot that already has a laborer on it, which is nice. And this one lets us remove a laborer and then immediately take another turn, which is a very powerful action that we um, probably should have used earlier in the game, but uh, have not quite used at this point. Now, we don't have any laborers at the moment, so we could potentially use a couple of our grain, and then we could buy a laborer from the market, and then we could put them out by using this boon. The issue is that I, when I look out to the board, the best thing we could possibly do is put a single sphinx down, and there are no valid spots in the, um, the current spot with the barge to get that bonus point. So it's essentially a two-point thing that we could potentially work our way towards if we do several things right and nothing gets blocked in the meantime. The opposite thing we could do is just withdraw right now and take a guaranteed point and I guess a brick which would help with tiebreakers. And I think at this point, when I try to see all of the different combinations, I think it's more likely that we'll get a uh, victory points out of just doing this. And I don't think we should try to shoot the moon just to try and maybe get one extra point but actually miss them entirely. So we are going to withdraw. That gets us one brick and then that gets us one point. So we're now at 28. The red player has decided that they're finally going to build their final sphinx of the game. They're going to put it over here, which is going to cost them two stone, three bricks, and one grain. Yellow now spends four of their grain in order to buy two stone from the market. 
and now Red decides to play this city card. It says Master Sculptor, and down the bottom it says that they can build a planned Sphinx on the same location as another Sphinx. So they have had this in their back pocket for a while. We thought we were going to block them, but it doesn't look like we did. In fact, they're going to take their Sphinx, build it on the same location as one of their previous ones, because this just says any Sphinx, and that is going to get them two points plus one for the barge, and it also means that they were able to get uh, three next to each other right here, and it means that they were able to get four um, uh, monuments on this one specific river chunk. So that was a pretty huge play. But for the moment, those three points bring them up to 27. We come again to the yellow player, and they are now going to plan their first and likely only Sphinx of the game. They'll put it down over here. And that costs them two bricks, two stone, and two grain. It now comes back to the red player, and they have decided that they are just going to withdraw. They potentially could spend resources to hire people, but the board is so full of monuments and other laborers that it doesn't really look like it's going to be able to get them to jump up and get any of these monuments down. So we can withdraw them, and actually just realized they got all of their sphinxes down, so that's plus one victory point when they place that one down, which means they're actually currently tied with us at 28 points. It's now Yellow's turn, and they're going to put the Sphinx down, and there's actually only one legal place on the whole map that they can play without playing some sort of special card, which they don't have, and that is this spot right down here, because that one over there is actually a three-grain region, so they'll put this down right there. There's no extra bonuses that they're going to get for that. That's just a straight two points, which bumps them up to 34. It comes back to them once again, but they are now done. They choose to withdraw, and that means that this round is over, and in fact, the game is over. This means it's now time for us to do the final scoring, which is just the two ending configurations of monuments. So we'll do the first one, which is having three monuments adjacent to each other for two points. It looks like the red player was able to do this twice on the board. We were able to do this only once because, again, even though we have four monuments adjacent to each other, you can only use each monument once per configuration, and the yellow player was also able to do this once. So yellow goes to 37, we go to 30, but red goes to 32. And now we can look at the second and final configuration, which is having four monuments adjacent to a specific river segment. We were able to do that once down here. Red was also able to do that once up here, but unfortunately the yellow player was never able to do that. So that means both uh, us and red get three points, which brings us to 33 and red all the way to 35. So there is the final score. Yellow was able to take the win just barely with a score of 36. Red had 35, and we bring up the rear with 33, unfortunately, and that completes a full game of Sailing Towards Osiris. Well, I hope you enjoyed this playthrough. This game really is all about acquiring the right set of resources at the right time to build the correct monument in the right spot out on the board, and there are a whole bunch of things to think about while you're trying to get all those things in line, and it's obvious that the game is pretty tight. The scores were within one point at the end of the game, uh, obviously because I missed the two-point bonus that we uh, should have had for getting all three of our obelisks out, and it just goes to show that uh, putting down a monument when the barge is in that specific part of the river can be very important that one point bonus could actually win you the game or not uh, when the scores are relatively low and also uh, quite tight. Now, I will admit that there was not really any negotiation that went on in this game, and that is uh, definitely part of this game, where the players can try to get the right resources by uh, bartering with their opponents so that they can maybe give things that they don't need anymore over to their opponents. Maybe it's cards, maybe it's laborers. There are a lot of different things that you can barter, and honestly, it was just one too many plates for me to spin as I'm trying to figure out what all these three players are doing. Uh, there was a tiny bit of it with the city cards, and I do feel like I would have uh, liked to have had the players go to the city actions a little bit more often to gather more of those cards because they do provide um, quite a bit of variety with the special actions that they can uh, do for you. Uh, for instance, the red player with the one that allowed them to put a sphinx down where there already was a sphinx, it was a very important thing for them to have in their hand. And obviously they played the game knowing that was in their hand, they played around it. And there are a whole bunch of other cards that uh, could have come out, but uh, we didn't see too many of them. But still, I think that this was a pretty good showing for how the game plays, all the central mechanics of how you could see the resource spots of variety increase as the barge goes down, but then also decrease as players plunk down the monuments to try and uh, strategically get in the way of what they think their opponents are going to do, while all the time trying to clump their monuments together and also get them on specific parts of the river. So with that, I think I've wrapped up all my thoughts on this specific playthrough. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting my channel through Patreon, including all of these producer-level pledges. If you too would like to directly support everything I do here, you can do so at patreon.com slash johngetsgames, and I'd really appreciate it. Also, if you'd like to see more full game playthroughs like this one, as well as in-depth board game reviews and vlogs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.